In this video, I'd like to introduce you to some of the basic ideas and concepts that are used throughout the book and by extension throughout the course. The 1999 Warner Brothers film, The Matrix, stands as one of my all-time favorite movies. In the film, Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, learns from Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne, that he has been living in a sort of virtual reality of generated computer code. While in the Matrix, Morpheus is capable of doing incredible things, and he tells Neo that he can too, as long as he understands the rules under which the Matrix operates. What you must learn is that these rules are no different than the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent, others broken. Although we do not live in a virtual reality programmed by machines, at least I don't think we do, we do live in a world that is generated by rules. And although we may not be able to bend or break these rules, we are capable of doing some pretty amazing things with our bodies if we understand them. Biomechanics, then, is a study of these rules. It is a study of the structure and function of biological systems by the means and methods of mechanics. With this impressive sounding definition out of the way, two questions may immediately come to mind. Why should I study these rules, and who needs to learn them? The reason why you need to study biomechanics can fall under two basic categories. One would be to improve performance, and the other would be to prevent injury. Both of these, I believe, falls under the umbrella of getting people to just move better. Now, when we talk about improving performance, we're talking about the performance of any human activity, including those part of everyday life. So yes, we can talk about improving the performance of elite athletes, but we're also talking about improving the ability of grandma to get up the stairs. When we talk about preventing injury, we have to think of two different types of mechanics. The first is mechanopathology. These are the mechanics that will result in an injury. But we also have pathomechanics. Pathomechanics are the alterations or changes in the mechanics as a result of injury. And these are important to know as well because pathomechanics can also be a source of mechanopathology. So how is it that we are going to improve performance or reduce the risk of injury? Again, we can think of two broad categories of how we can make these changes happen. One would be by modifying technique we are actually going to change the way the person is moving. The second is going to be by modifying the equipment that the person is using. And just like what I said with improving performance, I would encourage you to think about modifying equipment in the broadest context possible. Yes, we can talk about using equipment in sport, such as football helmets or ski poles, but we can also talk about using shoes or even changing the texture of a floor. If the answer to the first question is that understanding biomechanics is important in helping people to move better, then the answer to the second question should be obvious. Anyone who is involved with the movement of people needs to understand the rules governing these movements. If you are, or are going to be, involved with teaching skills, such as a physical educator, personal trainer, dance instructor, or coach, preventing or rehabilitating from an injury, such as an athletic trainer, physical therapist, chiropractor, or physician, designing equipment to be used by people, such as an ergonomist or engineer, or modifying the structure of the body, such as an orthopedic surgeon, then you need to study biomechanics. Biomechanics is a rich field with a broad number of applications. Our focus is going to be on understanding the core concepts, the rules governing human movement. You will learn more about the applications in discipline-specific classes. Now that you understand why you should know the rules of human movement, you can begin to study them. The rules are roughly grouped into three sets of principles, and we can talk about mechanical rules. These are going to be the rules of physics, or more specifically, classical mechanics. Next, you have to understand that even though we are subjected to the same rules of physics as any other body, we are biological beings, and as a biological being, you will not violate the rules of physics, but you do influence them in a particular way. This is where the bio portion of biomechanics comes in. For example, you may already know Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. 
Don't worry too much about it if you do not. You will learn more about this in the lesson on linear kinetics. For now, suffice it to say that this is the law of one of the foundations of classical mechanics, and you are as affected by it as any other object on Earth. However, in many instances, the source of F in Newton's second law are your muscles. And although the law will always hold up, a rather large number of factors based on anatomy and physiology of your muscle influence the production of force. Our final set of rules concern the fact that our bodies are considered multi-segmental systems. If you've ever studied physics, you may have been limited to looking at single bodies, such as cannonballs or levers. However, the human body is not a single element, although it can sometimes be modeled that way, but it is made up of many different connected segments. For example, the simple act of reaching for something require movement of both the upper arm as well as the forearm, and throwing will require the coordinated activity of the lower extremities, trunk, and upper extremities. Some unique properties emerge when the body is looked at as a system of interacting elements rather than a single body. This final set of rules acknowledges the multi-segmental nature of the human body. Now, I am probably very biased, but when it comes to dealing with human movement problems, I think it all boils down to your ABCs. The A here stands for anatomy, and we have to understand that form dictates function. And I don't think enough people actually spend time considering anatomy when they're trying to correct how somebody is moving. Second is going to be biomechanics. This is, after all, a biomechanics class, but I believe, once again, that knowing the rules that govern human movement are absolutely necessary if you're going to try to tackle any type of movement problem. And the C here stands for common sense. Now, somebody once told me a long time ago that it's not common sense if you've never done it before. When I think of common sense, I think of not only applying a certain logic to certain problems, but also being able to draw on a vast amount of experience. And you get experience by both experiencing something yourself, as well as reading about the experiences of others. So I would encourage you to both read, as well as experience things in the real world working with real people. Now let's get into a little bit of specifics as they relate to this course. I already told you that we live in a world that is governed by rules, and the code of those rules are written in mathematics. Once again, I'm biased, and I like to echo the sentiments of Leonardo da Vinci, who said that no knowledge can be certain if it is not based upon mathematics or upon some other knowledge, which is itself based upon the mathematical sciences. Now, I'm sure some of you have probably had a pretty bad experience with math in the past and do not echo the sentiments of Leonardo da Vinci, but rather those of St. Augustine, who said, beware of the mathematicians and all those who make empty prophecies. The danger already exists that the mathematicians have made a covenant with the devil to darken the spirit and to confine man into the bonds of hell. Now that's a pretty extreme view on math, and I hope you don't feel quite that strongly about it. Now, whenever students complain to me about math, I'm reminded of a story about Albert Einstein. A sixth grader wrote Albert Einstein and was complaining about the problems that she was having with math. Einstein actually did take the time to write her back, and his reply was, do not worry about your difficulty with mathematics, I can assure you that mine are still greater. And I can assure you that whatever problems you're dealing with mathematics, my problems are still greater. But math is really important because not only does it allow us to quantify certain things, but it also gives us a logical operating system. For example, let's take a look at this simple equation right here. This would be one line of code. But let's think about all the different things that can come out of this one line of code. First, we can see that whatever element C is, it is going to be completely determined by variables A and variables B. Also, this simple line of code tells us that between A and B, B is going to have a much more profound impact on C than will A, 
because in this case, b is squared or raised to a higher power. Of course, we can also rearrange our equation and be able to be given other information, such as in this case, a is completely determined by c and b, and now because c is in the numerator and b is in the denominator, an increase in c will lead to an increase in a, whereas an increase in b will lead to a decrease in a. And once again, because b is squared, it will have a more profound impact on a than we'll see. Now, you could spend a lot of time memorizing all these different facts about a, b, and c, or you can just learn to read that one line of code, manipulate it, and be able to apply it. And I think the latter strategy just makes much more sense. Now, since we will be using equations throughout the course, it's important that you realize the symbols that will go into it. And here I just want to briefly explain the different parts of a particular symbol. First, we have the main variable. In this case, this stands for position, something you'll learn about in a little bit. But that ends up being our main variable that we're talking about. If we have a leading superscript, and we will only have a leading superscript when it's necessary, that leading superscript will tell us which dimension it is that we're working in. The following superscript will tell us something about time. And again, time is going to be extremely important to us. If we are missing a following superscript, then that means that we are at a first instant of time. Our second instant of time will be denoted with a prime symbol. Our third instant of time would be denoted by two prime symbols, and so on. And finally, our following subscript will tell us which body or element that it is that we're talking about. And again, we'll only use that following subscript whenever it's necessary. So those are our parts of a symbol. We are also going to make extensive use of what are referred to as hierarchical models, which a lot of my students shorten to just be calling H models. With an H model, we put the result up in the very, very top box. Below that, we start to put down the mechanical correlates that will determine whatever that result happens to be. And then below that, we will fill in boxes that have the factors that determine those correlates. Now, if this isn't making too much sense to you, don't worry about it right now, because we'll have extensive practice throughout the course. But I do want to mention that once we fill out our H model, we want to go back and cross out those factors that we can't control so that we emphasize those factors that we can. Next, I'd like to briefly discuss the idea of a vector and a scalar. A vector is something that has both a magnitude as well as a direction, whereas a scalar has a magnitude, but it has no spatial direction. So scalars are going to be things like mass or temperature. Vectors are going to be things like velocities and accelerations, and we'll discuss those more when we get into the course. So remember, vectors have both a magnitude as well as a spatial direction, whereas scalars have a magnitude but no spatial direction. We are going to make extensive use of vectors, and so it's important to realize that vectors are going to be depicted with arrows. They will actually point in that particular spatial direction, whether that be up, down, left, or right or even, as the arrow depicted here shows, a diagonal. The length of the arrow will indicate its magnitude, so a short arrow will have a smaller magnitude than a longer arrow. Now, we will depict linear quantities, and again, we'll discuss more what linear quantities are a bit later in the course. Linear quantities will be determined with straight arrows, where angular quantities will be depicted with curved arrows. Next, throughout the course, we are going to make extensive use of process boxes. With process boxes, we will have an input and an output with a process box in the center. And the process box will show us how we get from our input to our output. 
And again, don't worry too much if this isn't making a whole lot of sense to you right now. Once we start seeing examples, I'm sure it will. And there you have it. That is our introduction to our course.